Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maya Loria with TMC for Seniors. And I am so excited that today we're going to talk about prevention to slow cardiovascular aging. I have Dr. Greg Koshkarian here with me. He is with Pima Heart and Vascular, and I want to share a little bit about, about Dr. Kashkarian because he's got a, quite the background. So I, I have to, I, I just have to share because I think it's so wonderful. He graduated from Stanford for his undergraduate degree and received his medical degree from Yale University School of Medicine. And he completed his internship and residency at Mount Sinai Medical Center, along with his interventional cardiology and general cardiology fellowships from Georgetown University Medical Center. In addition, he completed a heart failure fellowship at Columbia Presbyterian. He is now a cardiologist at the Heart and Vascular and treats patients with all forms of cardiac disease, including coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and other arrhythmias and valvular heart disease. Wow. Um, he evaluates symptoms that are potentially cardiac related as he believes that preventative care is important for all of his patients. I want to welcome you here, Dr. Kashkarian. It is so great to have you in the building. You have a full house uh, in person, and we also have an online audience as well that's watching today. So I'm going to turn it over to you to get started. And then if you have questions and you are at home, please go ahead and leave them in the chat, and we'll ask this after the presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Maya, and thank you all for coming out today. It's nice to see all of you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about heart disease in general with a, um, with a focus on how we try to prevent the heart and the vascular system from aging, so preventing cardiovascular aging. So broke up this talk into a few topics. My mic is muted. Did I mute this? Okay. It says Mike is muted. You're good. You're not muted. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> they can hear you. What's that? They can hear you. You're good. Sounds good. All right. So, what are demographics? That means who gets heart disease. So, what are the what are the kind of risk factors um, that that uh, lead people to get heart disease? Who gets it? Um, how does atherosclerosis? Develop atherosclerosis is a Latin term for basically hardening of the arteries. So we'll talk a little biology. Um, are you at risk? Again, getting back to the risk factors, who specifically gets this disease? And then we'll turn to heart attacks. What causes a heart attack? What are the symptoms of a heart attack? What should you do if you have uh, symptoms? And how do we treat it? And we'll and we'll wrap up with uh, some more discussion of prevention. Not advancing. Um, you use keyboard too. Maybe not. Let's try this. Okay. So this is a graph that shows what the incidence of heart disease uh, is as we get older. And you can see that it goes up markedly as we age, um, particularly above at, at and above the age of 60. And there's two bars, one is for men, one is for women, um, showing that at any given age, men have more cardiovascular disease than women do, but it is definitely not a disease of men as, as traditionally was thought back when I was in training 30 or so years ago. Um, women have a very substantial burden of heart disease. And I've, I actually um, included some slides in here that I have used before for a women in heart disease lecture. And, and since I always like to emphasize that both genders need to be thinking about this problem, I've included some of that in this, uh, in this topic. So what are the leading causes of death in women after the age of 65? So Alzheimer's, 6%, something we're all scared of getting. Um, right next to it is stroke at 7%. Lung diseases like emphysema, 9%. And then we jump up to 19% with cancer. So very substantial burden uh, from cancer. But heart disease, 25%. So heart disease is a greater risk to women over the age of 65 than all cancers combined. And most 
most people, most women, but most men don't realize that, that, that heart disease is what you have to fear the most. So this, this lecture is relevant to both men and women. And that's, that's what I really want to emphasize. So pathophysiology, how does heart disease develop? I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I, I just want to give you kind of a flavor of what this process is of, of atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a disease of the endothelium. So the endothelium is this inner lining of the vessel. Okay, and we have kind of three, three layers of our arteries. We have the inner lining, the endothelium, we have the muscle layer, and then we have the adventitia. The adventitia, because these arteries are kind of big, they need their own blood supply and they have their own neural supply. Um, the muscle is what creates tone for the vessel. So when uh, an organ needs more blood flow, the muscle relaxes. And when it needs less, less blood flow, the muscle is more constricted. And then we have the endothelium. And the endothelium is what gets diseased and leads to atherosclerosis. So it's really a disease of that inner lining. A healthy endothelium will be impermeable to bad things like cholesterol, um, inflammatory cells and markers. And a diseased endothelium, unfortunately, lets these substances uh, go underneath that endothelial surface into what we call the subendothelial space. Um, and what happens then is that uh, in inflammatory cells, uh, cholesterol, and cholesterol in various forms, what we call cholesterol esters and other sort of particles that are not healthy. If you go back to your total cholesterol, most of the total cholesterol isn't healthy. The HDL is healthy, everything else is unhealthy. So LDL is the biggest component, but there is VLDL, there's chylomicrons, there's IDL. There's not that you need to know all those things, but realize that there's lots of different forms the cholesterol comes in, and these particles get taken up under the endothelial space and start creating this growing plaque. And you can see it here growing into the, um, into the lumen of the vessel. And there's these things called foam cells. Foam cells are macrophages, they're kind of scavenger cells that start to gobble up the cholesterol. And they get kind of big and, and fluffy and they look like foam. And that's why they're called foam cells. Over time, these foam cells get so big that they burst. And so the, then the subendothelial sp space has a bunch of what we call acellular debris that is called the necrotic core. And it's necrotic because it's, it, it's cells that have died. So you've got pieces of cells there, you've got cholesterol there, you've got something called tissue factor there, which is uh, a molecule that, that lives in that, in that space. You've got also other inflammatory cells. So basically what you have here is a plaque that is, think of it as a little abscess. It actually is a higher temperature than the surrounding tissue. So if you, when they've actually done studies where they can put little micro temperature probes into the plaque, they find that it's a few degrees warmer than, than other tissue, just like an abscess would be. You know, when you have a skin infection or an abscess and you touch it, it feels warm. That's what this, this is that's growing. Now, as the plaque grows, we used to think in the old days and probably when I was in medical school in the 80s, it was felt that plaque grew gradually until it eventually occluded a vessel and caused a heart attack. Um, but there was a curious thing that people had heart attacks and often didn't have any symptoms right before the heart attack. So how do you have a heart attack with 100% blockage and two or three days later, you had a 95% blockage and it had no symptoms? And what they discovered, uh, uh, and this was with multiple studies, but one key study was a pathologist named Glatkoff took um, autopsy samples of arteries, um, not only people who had died of heart attacks, but just the general population. And what he found was that as a plaque grows, it actually doesn't grow inward at first, it grows outward. And you can see that the lumen of the vessel, the opening, is the same in each of these three vessels as the plaque grows. So it's called remodeling. It's like the vessel is growing bigger to accommodate the plaque that is growing, okay? And he came up with um, sort of a graph that showed that above, below 40% of the cross-sectional area, so the cross-sectional area would be the area within this sort of dark orange and white area, 
If this did not occupy at least 40%, it would grow outward. After 40%, it started to grow inward. So in this third one here, you can see that this lumen is a little smaller than that lumen. And that's because this volume is now over 40% it has outstripped the ability of the artery to grow and accommodate it, and now the plaque is starting to grow inward. And over here, you see a, a lot of plaque, and I think everybody would agree that there's a lot of plaque here in this artery. But if you all you saw was the lumen, this lumen, I would say, and, and this is just a rough estimate, this vessel from the, compared to this vessel is probably less than 50% narrowed. And a person who has this amount of plaque and this amount of luminal narrowing is probably not gonna have any symptoms because at less than 50% or even at 50%, most people still have enough blood flow that they're not having angina. Um, why is that? Why, why, why doesn't it cause people to have symptoms? There is a certain redundancy in our arteries. We, we would want a system where as soon as there was a little impingement, a person started to have compromise. Um, this redundancy is created by other little vessels downstream. So the little, the little smaller vessels will start to dilate to make up for the narrowing of the big vessel. And why people start having angina is after approximately 50, 60% narrowing, now this, these little vessels can't dilate any further and there is start, starting to be compromise of, of blood flow. But the point of this is that it takes a lot of plaque before you ever see indentation of the artery and even more plaque before you start to have symptoms of angina. All right, so that's the basic process of plaque formation. What causes coronary artery disease? I mean, this is the biological process. Who gets it is, is another way of putting it. So again, when I was in training, being a man was considered to be a risk factor for heart disease, but we don't consider that anymore. Both genders are are at risk. It's just that men tend to get it about 10 years earlier than women. So we now consider being male at 45 or above or female 55 or above to be a risk factor. Um, having a family history, and by family history, we're talking about first degree relatives, so uh, siblings, parents, children, um, in a male relative before the age of 55 and a female uh, relative before the age of 65. So these are your so-called non-modifiable risk factors. You can't do anything about your gender and your genes. Um, although I suppose you can do something about your gender, but it doesn't change your risk. Um, modifiable risk factors. So high cholesterol, I use the term dyslipidemia. These are, this basically means abnormalities in the sort of fat contents in the bloodstream. High blood pressure is a risk factor. Diabetes is a huge risk factor. It's such a big risk factor that it's often called a cardiac risk equivalent, meaning people who have diabetes have, and have never had a heart problem have approximately the same risk of a future heart attack as a person who already knows they have a heart problem and doesn't have diabetes. So not quite as high, but pretty close to it. So diabetes is one of the most potent risk factors. And then smoking is a, is a very big risk factor. And these are kind of the main ones that that your doctors will ask you about when you go to an appointment, either with your primary care physician or, your, or certainly with a cardiologist. So what are our goals for these modifiable risk factors? Um, I will take a step back about cholesterol and say something that most of you will be surprised by. A normal LDL cholesterol is about 50. When you get your blood drawn and you get the results in the lab, tells you what a normal range is. Some will say normal is under 130. Some will say normal is under 100. None of them will say normal is 50. And the reason is that cholesterol is not really regulated in our bloodstream. It isn't that, that our body um, does things to try to keep it in a certain range. This is as opposed to your electrolytes. So if you, um, if, if you look at your potassium level and it says normal is say between 3.5 and 5.3, if you eat a lot of extra potassium or you don't eat enough potassium, your body will tend to either hold on to potassium or get rid of potassium to keep you in that range. And if you fall outside that range, it can be life-threatening fairly quickly. That's not true with cholesterol. Cholesterol is not regulated in that way. And high cholesterols don't immediately cause any life-threatening things the effects of high cholesterol occur literally over decades. 
So we're born with LDL cholesterol of about 50. We eat Western diets. That does not mean Arizona diets. That means Western world diets. And our cholesterols all go up on average to about an LDL of 130. So when the, when the labs are t saying that under 130 is quote normal, they're basically saying you're below average. But average is two and a half times what is actually biologically normal. So we look at most people as having too high a cholesterol for what is healthy. And therefore we divide people into categories of who do we treat and who do we treat more aggressively. So returning to this slide, if you have known coronary artery disease or symptomatic vascular disease, like you've had an amputation or needed a stent in your leg, um, or you have um, a carotid artery that uh, has needed to be operated on or has caused a stroke, you are in a category where you are put on a high intensity statin medication. So high intensity statins are basically Crestor and Lipitor. Um, other people are at high risk are people whose LDLs are very high, like 190 or above. And what's called a Framingham risk. So I don't have that word in here. You can write that down. Framingham is a city in Massachusetts that start, started a demographic study in 1948. And it's actually where the term cardiac risk factor comes from. So they collected a bunch of data on people and found what kinds of things cause people to have heart attacks. And that's, and that's where high blood pressure and high cholesterol and all those kinds of things were discovered. So you can actually calculate your Framingham risk by putting in some of your own personal information into a program and it will give you what your 10 year risk is. So this greater than or equal to 20% is over 10 years. Um, and like I said, you can calculate that for yourself. There's all sorts of nomograms online to allow you to do that. Uh, other people who should be on medication for cholesterol patients with diabetes, moderate intensity statins are what are generally recommended. But if a person with diabetes has other risk factors, they should also consider a high intensity statin medication. Um, now we have our intermediate uh, range of people, 5% to 20% risk. These are people to consider a moderate intensity statin medication and look at other sort of less commonly uh, looked at risk factors that kind of push you to be more worried, less worried. So for instance, the Framingham risk you, you look at online and that we use on our, on our smartphones to calculate a person's risk doesn't include family history. So family history is one of the risk factors. And I'm kind of looking at, at this area here that we call risk enhancers. Um, having chronic kidney disease enhances your risk. Metabolic syndrome, those are people who have, um, who are overweight more in their central area, um, have uh, very high triglycerides, very low HDL, have smaller LDL particles. These are all people who have what's sort of called metabolic syndrome. Inflammatory diseases, so people with things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, they have a higher risk than the average person. Ethnicity factors. I, do I see anybody here of South Asian descent? Um, I don't think so. But Indians, Pakistanis, um, people from Sri Lanka, all these people actually have a higher risk just from their genetic background out of proportion to other risk factors. And that's been discovered over the last 20 years or so. Um, that's considered a risk enhancer. Um, Biomarkers and lipids. So we talked about lipids. LP little a is not routinely measured. LP little a is a risk factor. Other, other biomarkers like um, high sensitivity C-reactive protein um, can lead you to be a little bit more worried about a person. Abnormal ABI, that's ankle brachial index. That's a measurement of the blood pressure in the leg versus the arm. It's a sign of peripheral vascular disease. So it's kind of a marker of vascular disease. Um, and then there's conditions specific to women. So women who go through menopause early um, and women who uh, had um, um, preeclampsia during pregnancy, they, they later have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And finally, we're doing a lot of calcium scores. So CAT scans that measure the calcium content of the arteries. Um, the more calcium you have, the more plaque you have. Calcium is not inherently bad. In fact, calcium stabilizes plaque but calcium is a marker of the plaque. You know, it's like you're, you're looking out in the mountains, you see a bunch of smoke and you know there's fire there even if you don't see the fire. And the more smoke you see, probably the more fire there is. The, the smoke isn't what is killing the trees, it's the fire. So think of the calcium as like the smoke that lets you know that there's fire there. 
All right, high blood pressure. Um, ten, 10 years ago or so, we said high blood pressure is anything over 140, over 90. It's now 130 over 80. And this isn't a random decision somebody made. It's based on studies that show that if you keep people under 130 over 80, they have less strokes, less heart attacks, die less frequently than people who are just kept under 140 over 90. Um, and prehypertension is now in the 120s over 70s. So those are our goals for blood pressure. Goals for diabetes are hemoglobin A1C between 6.0 and 7.0. Um, for those who aren't familiar with hemoglobin A1C, it's a, it's a marker of what your average sugar has been over the previous three, week, three months, um, normal being 5.6 or less. So prediabetes is considered 5.7 to 6.4. Diabetes is considered uh, 7 point, I'm sorry, 6.5 6 or above. And then there are other uh, sugar levels, but we don't rely on those as much anymore now that we so frequently use the hemoglobin A1C. Other, other ways of treating diabetes are getting your weight down and exercising regularly. Both of those are good for your overall health and specifically good for diabetes. And the goals for smoking, none. <laughs> so there's no safe amount of smoking. I will say though, that if you absolutely can't quit, it's better to smoke less than it is to smoke more. But but don't don't deceive yourselves. No amount of smoking is, is safe. All right, so how does a heart attack present? We go back to our biology of the vessel. It usually occurs when that covering over that plaque that has been growing breaks, and we call that plaque rupture. When that happens, blood hemorrhages into the plaque, but more importantly, and not seen in this picture, but is seen in this picture, is the plaque extrudes outward. And what is inside this plaque, we talked about it before, what is inside of it with these inflammatory cells and cholesterol esters and tissue factor is very thrombogenic. So that means it causes clot to form. And people have a vague idea that heart attacks are caused by clots. But a lot of people, I think, get the idea that clots forming, along, forming in the bloodstream, it's traveling through the blood vessels, and it lodges in, in the heart vessel. That's not what happens. The blood is naturally clot-free, so there aren't generally clots floating around in your bloodstream. But the, but the blood has factors in it that can form clot, and they get activated when they think a person is bleeding. So when you cut yourself, when you first start bleeding, your blood is kind of watery. And if you wait a while, you notice it becomes a little thicker and eventually you stop bleeding because your clotting factors have become activated. Now, how does the blood know to activate? Well, when the blood vessel is injured, there are things in the wall of the vessel that aren't supposed to be seen by the blood because they're only seen when the blood vessel breaks. And they cause the, the clotting cascade to activate, they cause the platelets to activate, they cause clot to form. When a person has plaque rupture in their coronary artery, the blood thinks that there has been an injury to the vessel. It, in its world, it only sees the stuff inside that plaque when a vessel has broken open. And so it activates to wall off what it considers to be a dangerous area of potential hemorrhage. And it can lead to the vessel totally clotting off. And that's what causes a heart attack. So what, hap what does a person experience who's having a heart attack? And I've used the term angina before, or angina, we usually say. Angina and a heart attack are very similar. I mean, they're, the, they're mostly the same symptoms, but a heart attack is generally more dramatic than, um, than just having angina. Although some people's angina attacks can feel like they're having a heart attack. Often it's just a matter of duration. If you interrupt blood flow to the heart for 10, 15 minutes, there'll be no damage. If you interrupt blood flow to the heart for 20 minutes or more, there will be damage, and that's what a heart attack is. Um, so what a person most frequently feels is pressure, tightness, or squeezing, and people often say it feels like an elephant is sitting on their chest. Um, sometimes it's more vague, just a discomfort, like mm, something's not right, my chest doesn't feel right, it feels uncomfortable. Um, shortness of breath is more often a symptom with the chest discomfort, but sometimes that's all a person will experience is sudden shortness of breath. Um, again, left arm discomfort or heaviness usually goes as a radiation of pain from the, from the chest down into the arm. Some, I've had people have had heart attacks where their only symptom is in their arm. Um, jaw pain or discomfort, similar to arm discomfort. 
Um, dizziness, feeling faint. Again, this is rarely the only symptom, mostly goes with some of the other symptoms of a heart attack and breaking into a sweat. Um, certainly, you know, people say, well, I sweat when I exercise. Most people sweat when they exercise, don't suddenly sweat. They doing more and more work, they form a little perspiration, they get more and more sweaty. People who are having heart attacks will suddenly break into a profuse sweat um, to distinguish that from the kind of the gradual sweating that occurs with exercise. So if these symptoms persist more than 15 minutes, call 911. Because I told you, up until about 15 minutes, there won't be any damage to your heart. But after 15 minutes, damage starts to occur. So people have probably heard this expression, women don't experience heart attacks the way men do. And when I put together this talk for women, I kind of looked into the research on this and interestingly found an article that kind of doesn't agree with this. So it looked at what do women experience versus what do men experience? Most women will experience chest pain just like men do, almost the same number and pressure and tightness. In fact, more women describe tightness than men did. All the other symptoms you see there, discomfort, pressing, crushing, backache, dry mouth, women experience more than men. There are a couple of reasons why, why, um, why people got it into sort of the stereotype that women don't experience typical symptoms. So by this, it looks like they do experience typical symptoms but they also experience atypical symptoms and they experience more atypical symptoms than men do. And I don't know if it's that they really do have more symptoms than men do or women are just better expressing what they're experiencing than men do and can describe more things than, than men tend to, uh, tend to uh, describe. So it could be one of either of those things. The other thing that is true is elderly people experience atypical symptoms more than younger people. Um, so looking back at the earlier slide about what ages people have their, uh, have heart attacks at, women tend not to have heart attacks before menopause. So more women are older when they have their heart attack, whereas there's a lot more men in their forties and fifties having heart attacks. And so that's another reason why women experience more atypical symptoms. But if you take a 70 year old man and a 70 year old woman, woman, they're both equally likely to have chest pressure heaviness. Um, and um, like I said, women may have more other symptoms. And, and I emphasize that because, you know, sometimes people come into my office and they tell me symptoms that just absolutely can't be their heart. Like they'll say, I feel this like pinprick sensation on my chest or my right thumb is going numb. And I'll say, it doesn't sound like it's your heart. And they say, well, women have atypical symptoms. Those aren't the kind of symptoms that, that, that women have. So, you know, definitely pay attention to your body. It's always good to get things checked out, but not all symptoms are heart symptoms. So, all right, so what should you do? I, I mentioned calling 911. I probably should put call 911 above call your doctor, but I put call your doctor in there because people don't always have symptoms continuously. So if you are, if you're having chest pain and it goes away in a few minutes and an hour later it comes back and you're thinking, do I need to go to the hospital? It doesn't, it may not be an emergency where you need to get there right away. Calling your doctor, describing the symptoms and letting your doctor decide, are they, are they worried enough? You know, if somebody, if somebody called me and said, I had five minutes of chest pain uh, an hour ago and I feel fine now, I wouldn't send them to the hospital. If they said, I, I felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest for five minutes and then it came back again 15 minutes later and it came back again another 15 minutes later and then I broke into sweat and I'm feeling fine now, I would send them to the hospital. So it can be helpful to call your doctor, but don't, don't wait a long time for them to come back, call back if you're having continuous symptoms. So we talked about this 15 to 20 minute grace period where you won't have any heart damage if the vessel is open within that time, if, if the pain is stopped. Um, but after that, don't, hes don't hesitate, get to the hospital. And don't worry about trying to decide, is this definitely my heart or is this not my heart? Let the doctors in the emergency room de de uh, decide that. A quick EKG and, and and troponins, uh, the, the enzyme that we measure in the bloodstream, can very quickly say whether a person is actively having a heart attack or not. We also talk about a golden hour, and this is another reason to get in quickly. So I said that there'll be 
no damage if you say close off a vessel and open it in 15 minutes. After that, there starts to be damage. But in the first 60 to 70 minutes, if you get in and you, let's say right now your vessel closes down, you break into a sweat, you're having crushing chest pain, you call 911 immediately, you get the, you, you get the 200 yards to TMC here, <laughs> and they say, wow, you're having a heart attack, they call uh, my partner, Dr. Wagner, you're in the cath lab 30 minutes later, 50 minutes later, your vessel's open. So from start of your symptoms to the vessel being opened is 60 minutes. You're gonna have measurable damage by the blood test, but the next morning when they do an ultrasound of your heart and look at your heart function, you probably won't see the signs of the damage. So that's where that golden hour is, is that there's there's only micro damage, there's no macro damage in that in that period of time. So again, don't hesitate, get to the hospital quickly. How do we treat heart attacks? We open the vessel. So I told you that heart attacks are caused by a vessel clotting off due to activation of the clotting system. Um, sometimes the vessel doesn't clot off 100%. It maybe goes in a matter of minutes from 50% to 90% because the clotting cascade doesn't get activated quite so vigorously enough to 100% include the vessel. And those kind of people will often have stuttering symptoms. They'll have crushing chest pain for 15 minutes, and then the body's natural lytic system that opens up, you know, dissolves clot will create a little channel, but then the platelets will recongregate. And so people's symptoms will kind of go be back and forth. And we call that unstable angina. If there's damage, we call it what's called a non, uh, an end STEMI, which means on an EKG, it won't look like an acute heart attack, but the blood tests show that there's been damage. We categorize all of these things as ACS, acute coronary syndromes. These are, these are coronary syndromes that are inherently unstable because a person has just started having symptoms or is having symptoms that are rapidly progressing. So we want to open the vessel as quickly as possible, and we do that uh, primarily by mechanical means, through balloons and stents, angioplasty and stents. We also use medication. So I told you that the pathophysiology of a heart attack is the activation of the clotting factors in the platelets. So we use, um, I'm actually, I should rearrange this. I'm gonna skip the thrombolytics. We use antithrombotics, so-called blood thinners like heparin, Lovenox, um, and they start to dissolve the clot. And we use antiplatelet agents like aspirin, Plavix, and things like that, which uh, inhibit platelets. It, those are the two components of what, uh, what forms clots. Um, but they don't work by themselves and they're adjuncts to the mechanical means. Thrombolytics or, or, or medicines that actually dissolve clot can be effective. They are not as effective as stents. So if you're in a city like Tucson where you're, where you're within easy reach of a hospital with a cath lab, that is always the preferred means of trying to open up a vessel. But if you live in a rural area where it could be a few hours before you can be uh, sent to a place where you can get a stent, uh, thrombolytics can be very helpful and, and often open the vessel. So as I said, we use combinations of mechanical and medication. All right, so I'm going to uh, transition to actual show and tell. Uh, these are stents. So this is an expanded stent off the balloon, and this is an expanded stent on a balloon, and again, off and on. So I don't have a picture of of the stent on the balloon that hasn't been expanded, but this is what it looks like. It's just that this uninflated balloon is going through it. And so we have these long catheters that are like this long so that we can put it in through either the groin vessel or the, or the uh, arm vessel long enough to reach the heart, balloon that's unexpanded and a stent that's sort of crimped onto there. And we then advance this uh, stent with a balloon over a wire, so this is a wire, so wires sort of like our railroad tracks, um, and we can guide it through uh, under the x-rays, uh, through the vessel, and we put the balloon with the stent over it, then we inflate the balloon, there's a little attachment at the end of the catheter where we uh, twist a little, a little device and it puts pressure into the balloon and it expands, so the balloon then gets, I'm sorry, the stent gets embedded into the blocked artery, the balloon is then deflated, and the stent stays in place and has opened up the vessel. And the stent, you can think of as a scaffolding. It, it's like you had a, 
had a sort of a, a, a mind collapse and you can quickly build scaffolding to prop everything up again. Luckily, we can do this quicker in the cath lab than they can do in mines. All right, so I'm going to hopefully successfully. Well, this is going to be a challenge. I'm not sure I have a hand-eye coordination to do this. Now that's weird. Maybe it doesn't want to play. So I did this. Okay. All right. So we'll pause here. I think everybody can see where this person's having a heart attack from. So this is actually a 45-year-old guy who didn't have a lot of risk factors. His LDL was 108. Not, not a really bad... Uh, LDL cholesterol, below average for most people, but it gets back to my point that 108 isn't normal, 50 is normal, and so his is twice as high as normal. He had a strong family history, he came in with chest pain, got put on some blood thinners, and they called me and came into the cath lab and found that blockage there. So I'm going to play through the views of the other views of the arteries. This is what we call an angiogram. The vessel's almost 100%, but it isn't 100%, or else there wouldn't be flow distal to it. So there is, a, there is some flow. And this was an example of somebody who's probably having stuttering symptoms, where, where when he woke up and started having terrible chest pain and came to the emergency room, that vessel might have been 100% occluded. By the time he got to the cath lab, the blood thinners we gave him allowed there to be a little trickle of flow so that the vessel was now open. Here's a, this vessel doesn't have any severe blockage, um, but I want to point out, I'm going to come around here. I, am, I hope I'm not blocking. Oh, I'll stand here so I don't block the ball. So we talked about how plaque grows outward first and that you have to have at least 40% of the vessel compromised in terms of plaque volume before it in even creates a little indentation. All it, you see, it may not be obvious to you, but there's like this irregularity in the wall of this vessel. Unfortunately, I don't have a, 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 a normal vessel. Normal vessels are 100% smooth. Like they, they just look pristine. This is kind of a little, little red here. Imagine all throughout here, there's already 40% plaque volume. Then you get down here where you say, well, there's maybe a 20 or 30 percent narrowing. To create a 20 or 30 percent narrowing, probably 60 to 70 percent plaque is occupying the cross-sectional area. This guy whose vessel was 99 percent blocked in that view, it is quite possible that before he woke up that morning having chest pain, it was 50 percent narrowed, and that's it. And then the plaque ruptured, the clotting cascade got activated, and suddenly it's 100%. And that's why people don't have symptoms most of the time before they have, have their heart attack, because a lot of times it quickly goes from 50% to 100%. The people who do have symptoms are the lucky people. They're not people, so you might think, oh, they're the people where it did grow from 50 to 60 to 70. Actually, more likely, they're people that went from 50 to 80% in a matter of minutes and started noticing, huh, when I walk across the room, I'm kind of getting shorter breath and a little chest pressure that I didn't have last week. Um, a lot of times people don't notice it at first, so they'll often come to the office and say, you know, over the last week or so, I've noticed such and such. They won't always be able to say, on Tuesday is the first day I felt this. Um, but some people do. And, and those people probably had plaque rupture, but luckily it didn't lead to 100% blockage. It led to a severe blockage that it started, started to cause symptoms. All right, so back to so what we do is finish this coronary artery, and then we have this wire down. So you see, the wire has a has a darker area on the end, and that's just so we can see the end of the of the uh, wire, and the little markers, these little dots here and here, they're markers for the balloon. So the balloon has markers, so as we're advancing the balloon, we can be putting it where we want to put it. 
So we have this balloon across the blockage. We expand the balloon and maybe a little bit better, not much. Then we put a stent in and it looks even better. And then we expand the stent and really embed it well into the artery. And now the vessel looks better than anywhere else. And he's not having chest pain anymore. And his heart attack has stopped. And he did fine. All right, so we talked a little bit about prevention in terms of risk factors. I'm gonna finish up the talk, reasonable time, with prevention after heart attack, but, but also before and, and getting back to some of the risk factors. So prevention to me is a partnership between me or, or the other physician and the patient. And it goes by A, B, C, D. The first is A for advice. And there's things that you can do for yourselves that I can advise you on. I can say, here's what your optimal weight would be um, and the things you can do to try to get yourself to that weight. Um, a healthy diet is a diet that's low in saturated fats, that's low in simple carbohydrates. So I can discuss diet with people. I'm not a dietitian, so I don't ever write out a whole diet for people, um, but I give people some guidelines. Um, exercise, so goals for exercise, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and I always tell people to quit smoking. And the best time to tell a person to quit smoking is when they have their heart attack. So it may sound cruel, but when a person is sitting there in bed, pale, sweaty, saying, doctor, do something for me, I say, you would not be here if you had not been smoking. And it, it sounds mean, but it really gets the point home. Those are the kind of people that actually quit smoking. Unfortunately, the people in my office that come in and say, my doctor sent me because I'm overweight and I don't exercise and I'm worried about my heart, and by the way, I smoke, I say, well, the best thing you can do is quit smoking. Probably 30% of them actually do that. But people have a heart attack and associate that pain of the heart attack with smoking, and not to mention the fear of dying, they, they quit smoking 80, 90% of the time. So it, advice is important. Then the things that I or, or your physician can do is choose medicines to help with blood pressure, to help with cholesterol, to help with diabetes. So those, that's the ABCD of prevention that involves a partnership between patients and their physician. So why is exercise good? Well, it leads you to be more fit. So what, is, what does that mean? Um, people who exercise have lower heart rates. They tend to have lower blood, pr uh, blood pressures. Um, and these are things that lead to the heart not having to work as hard. There are musculoskeletal effects. So people who exercise regularly, their, their muscles you know, in addition, they look nicer, they're toned and, and, and all that kind of thing, the, they develop more capillaries. So there are more blood vessels in the legs um, when you've been running or biking or doing other things, you use your, your uh, leg muscles. Um, they, there are more enzymes to take up oxygen. The blood vessels that are there dilate more easily. And these indirectly have effects that are beneficial to the heart. So when the heart's pumping blood, it likes the blood vessels not to be tight and constricted. It, it likes the vessels to be relaxed. So, so when you can exercise and your blood vessels dilate very easily, there's less resistance for the heart to put, pump against. Um, benefits, risk factors for heart disease. So high blood pressure is that easier, more easily controlled in people who exercise. Um, some of the lipids improve. So LDL does, isn't affected a whole lot, but HDL tends to go up, triglycerides tend to go down. Diabetes, we talked about earlier, as something that is helped by exercise uh, on, on, in all sorts of ways. Um, the more muscle mass you have versus fat mass, the better sugar utilization you have. Um, exercise also helps people lose weight, and that is beneficial for diabetes. And just talked about the weight loss that is helped by, uh, by exercising. It's very hard to lose weight by only dieting or by only exercising. You really need to do both things. So what we recommend moderate exercise. And what does moderate mean? 60, 80% of your maximal predicted heart rate, where your maximal predicted heart rate is 220 minus your age. And I will step back a moment and say, there's nothing magic about that number. That's really based on population averages. It isn't dangerous to exceed your maximal rate. You're not gonna blow up if you're 70 and your heart rate goes up to 151 instead of 150. Um, this is just, like I said, this is a population average. Some people don't ever reach their maximal heart rate. Some people exceed their maximal heart rate. 
So as I said, for a 70 year old, the maximal heart rate is 150. So 60, 80% of that is between 90 and 120. I don't actually recommend people use their heart rate as a means of deciding if they're exercising to the right level for a couple reasons. One, it's not always easy to get an accurate heart rate depending on what form of exercise you're doing. Um, you know, some of these, some of these machines, you know, you hold a bar and it tells you your heart rate, but I'm not convinced that that is always hundred percent accurate, but more importantly, as I said, these numbers are population averages. People, some people's heart rates just don't get up as high as other people's. Uh, and a lot of people are medicines that prevent their heart rate from going up, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. The benefit of exercise is not in getting your heart rate up. You're not actually exercising your heart. I mean, you are to some extent, but that's not actually where the benefits to the heart are from. It's not that my heart is, is lazy and I need to exercise it every now and then. Your heart's exercising every second of the day. It's your muscles that are lazy if you're not exercising. And it's all the changes that occur with exercise in your muscles and blood vessels that make it easier for the heart to do what it needs to do. So the heart rate is really just a marker that you've reached a certain intensity of exercise. And so what I usually recommend to people is to use something more subjective, that you're breathing more heavily, but not gasping for air, um, that if somebody walked into the room, you would find it difficult to hold a fluid conversation. You certainly wouldn't be able to talk as consistently and quickly as I tend to talk. I can't do this when I'm exercising, but you can't answer questions. So you shouldn't be so out of breath that you're like, I can't answer, you know, you can't, you don't need to be doing that. So somewhere in between the extremes of I can talk fluently and I can hardly talk at all. And, and one, one uh, um, sort of expression we use is you can talk, but you can't sing. Um, breaking into a little sweat isn't bad. Uh, at a given level of exercise, if you suddenly bef become profusely sweaty and, and feel dizzy, that might be a sign that you're doing too much. And so our goal is 150 minutes a week divided over four to five days. So I usually say there are 30 minutes a day for five days, 40 minutes a day for four days. And that's the goals for exercise. So let's talk a little bit about diet. I told you I'm not a dietitian, but um, I found these really nice pictures and put some words to go with them. Um, so what are healthy proteins? So fish, fish is one of the healthiest proteins. And by the way, accepting a couple prescription fish oils, most fish oil does, has not been proven to have cardiovascular benefit. Much better to eat fish than it is to take fish oil tablets. Um, and, and it's because fish oils are healthy, um, but it's hard to get all the right ones and enough of them in a pill, and besides, I think fish tastes good. So get, get, your, get your protein from fish. Lean meats, chicken, turkey, uh, pork loin, so it's a leaner part of pork. Eggs have conflicting data. For years, it was terrible to eat eggs, then it became no eggs are great. Now we're kind of somewhere in between. My rule of thumb is an egg a day isn't, isn't a bad thing, but I wouldn't eat multiple eggs a day. Um, beans and lentils are, and, and tofu are a great source of protein, as are nuts and seeds. When it comes to fat, we want polyunsaturated or monounsaturated. We don't want saturated fats, which is what you find in animal, meaning mammalian <coughs> fat. And I listed some of the healthy oils, olive oil, safflower, sunflower, grapeseed, flaxseed, soybean, corn oil. Carbohydrates, the goal is to have unprocessed carbohydrates. So I, I didn't know this till recently, but we all, need, we all need carbohydrates. I mean, we need it for energy. When you process them, you take off the husk, and there's a lot of healthy things in that. And you're left with the pure starch. And starch all by itself, yeah, we need some, but it leads to sugar shooting up quickly in the bloodstream. Think of starch as just a complicated sugar. It's, it's a bunch of sugars attached to one another, and it gets broken down into pure sugar, even if you don't think of starch as a sweet thing. Um, so unprocessed carbohydrates aren't good. And the rule of thumb here is brown, not white when it comes to pasta and bread and rice and potatoes. So a healthy diet, and, and this, is, this is where I turf my dietary recommendations to the internet. And I don't usually turf things to the internet, but I tell people Google Mediterranean diet and look up what that has in it because those are heart healthy things. So it, it has a lot of fish, it cooks with olive oil, legumes, uh, the nuts we talked about, lots of fruits and vegetables and unprocessed cereals and grains. 
A word about supplements. I'm not a big proponent of supplements. Very few have ever been tested scientifically, meaning in randomized trials where you give some people the supplement and some people not to supplement and they don't know which one it is. Most, most studies on supplements don't use that kind of rigorousness. And so A, they haven't been tested and B, it's my philosophy that nature puts healthy things together in packets and those packets are called food. And it's often important what the, what molecule, um, what the other molecules with the so-called healthy molecule are. Um, it's very hard to extract something, a single molecule, and be certain that it's doing for you what it did for you in the context of, of the rest of the things in the food. And one example of that is vitamin E. So vitamin E is an antioxidant. And it was touted 20 years ago, maybe longer, actually it was longer, it was before I started practice, so probably 30 years ago, as an important thing because it's an antioxidant, antioxidants are good. And then they did studies and eventually showed it isn't good and there's probably a trend to it not being good for you. And one of the reasons is that antioxidants are antioxidants in a certain, um, what we call redox state. Like it depends on what the level of oxidation is in the environment that it is sitting in. And so in certain states, it can actually be a pro-oxidant. In other states, it can be an antioxidant. And so again, separating out the molecule from the environment it travels with in food won't necessarily get you what you think it's getting you. So eat healthy foods, not extracted molecules. So in summary, heart disease affects all of us, women as well as men. Risk factors can be identified. And if you treat those risk factors, it'll lower your risk. You can prevent bad things like heart attacks from happening. Um, if a heart attack does occur, it can be treated. Um, so you should get in quickly and, and particularly within that golden hour. And finally, prevention is a partnership between you and the physician to slow cardiovascular aging. Thank you very much. So thank you. I have a couple of questions that came in that I wanted to ask. One was about um, using, is it, and I, I want to make sure I pronounce it right. I'm not sure if I have it right. Is it preluent? Preluent. Preluent. Pre um, uh -huh. Will that drastically reduce um, somebody's cholesterol? I understand it will drastically reduce a cholesterol numbers, but does it change the coronary calcium score? Okay. So those are two very different questions. Preluent and Repatha and now Inclycerin are all medicines that work on a molecule called PCSK9, which was discovered maybe a decade ago to play a role in how LDL is processed. And by reducing um, or inhibiting PCSK9, um, it, it makes there be more LDL receptors and the LDL receptors take LDL out of the, uh, out of, um, out of the bloodstream and they lower cholesterol levels. So Praluent and Repathin and Clistrin all have marked uh, cholesterol reducing effects. They can reduce LDL cholesterol by 60 or 70%. This does translate into a reduction in your risk of having a heart attack, um, 30, 35% or so. Um, studies are continuing to be to be done, but that's, that's an appreciable effect. It's not as much as high intensity statins have been shown to, to benefit. They reduce the risk by between 40 and 50%. So that's why statins are our first line agent. But getting back to the question about the calcium, virtually nothing will lower your calcium score. And that is because once the calcium is there, it doesn't go away. But the good news is you don't need it to go away. The calcium isn't what is bad. The plaque is what is bad. And they can reduce the plaque. So if you get your LDL very low, below 70 and even below 50, you can see plaque reg regression. The unfortunate thing is you can't use the calcium score to prove that that's happened. If I could, if I took a person who had a calcium score, let's say randomly of 200, and, and we know that that person has plaque in their arteries, and what if I could say, you know what, I have this drug that will prevent you from forming any more plaque the rest of your life, and amazingly, it's gonna get rid of half the plaque that's there. Well, we don't have anything that's that good, but even if we did, and I repeated a calcium score 10 years later, it would go up because the plaque that has been there for the next 10 years would have had some time to calcify. So 
Again, that's not inherently a bad thing because the calcification actually stabilizes the plaque, but it's one of the reasons why we don't use calcium scores to follow this disease process. We can't say, well, this is working because your calcium score went down or it's not working because your calcium score went up. We use calcium scores mainly as a single point in time to say, look, we just discovered something you didn't know was lurking there. Okay, thank you. What about, um, is there a point when making changes to your modifiable risk factors is too late? Mm -hmm. Is it ever too late? After you die. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I'm being a little flippant, but that's, that is the answer. It's, it's never too late because whatever has happened to you, more stuff can happen. Okay. Uh, right. I mean, there's there's not like it, there's not like a limit of how many heart attacks or strokes you can have. So if you are somebody who has risk factors and something bad has happened or many bad things have happened and you interfere with, you know, you stop the bad things that you're doing, you're smoking, overweight, not exercising, you will lower your risk. You know, unfortunately, there is there is nothing that can perfectly protect a person. And people are often frustrated that not only can I not prescribe something or tell you to do something where I can guarantee nothing will happen, um, but I also, unfortunately, don't have a test that will say, this test tells you nothing will happen. So you have to look at everything as a risk. You know, we all, most of us drove here today. Most of us don't get in the car saying, can somebody please guarantee that nobody's going to hit me on my way to this lecture today? You know, life is full of risks and we try to behave in a way that minimizes that risk. So we drive you know, at a reasonable speed, we use our turn signals, um, we don't text while we're driving, we wear seatbelts. Each of these things individually lowers your risk of being injured in a car accident. But none of those things, even all together, guarantee it's not gonna happen. That doesn't mean they're useless and it doesn't mean I'm not gonna drive, you can't guarantee me something that's not gonna happen. Okay. One last question that I had come in was, um, if somebody has a dilated right ventricle that's showing on their echo cardiogram report, would that be something that they would, should be concerned about if all the other results were normal? So the short answer is probably, but you know, usually there's other things that can help answer that question. You know, if, if, if I'm reviewing a, an echocardiogram of the person and they have a dilated right ventricle, it will lead me to ask certain questions to try to answer why do they have a dilated right ventricle. So this question doesn't particularly relate to the topic of coronary heart disease, but right ventricular dilation is potentially a dangerous thing. It can mean that the right ventricle is struggling to pump due to problems in the lungs. So people have had clots in their lungs uh, can di develop a dilated right ventricle. People with other pulmonary or lung diseases, people have emphysema or other forms of COPD. Um, some people have um, a genetic abnormality that leads to the right ventricle being dilated. So, so the answer is even if everything looks fine, I wouldn't ignore that. Doesn't mean it's immediately, you know, you know, lethal to a person, but it shouldn't be blown off because everything else looks okay. Okay. Can you tell us where you're located? Where are you, where are your, off, where's your office? Okay. So I have three offices. I have an office uh, in Oro Valley that is right next to the movie theater. Um, we just moved there from the medical office building at the hospital uh, a couple months ago. I have an office on Orange Grove in La Pinata. And I also have a clinic out in Rita Ranch. Uh, which is a TMC1 office uh, that, that they're kind enough to let me use uh, a couple Fridays. Excellent. Okay. So if somebody wants to make an appointment, I am putting the phone number up. It is 520-838-3540. Uh, Just give them, the call, give them a call. That is basically where you would schedule for any physician over at Pima Heart and Vascular. So I wanted yep. to put that up. Um, I, you have answered all the questions I have today. I want to tell you, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. And I'm going to turn it over so you can answer uh, any questions in the audience and I'll wrap up online. Thank you. Thank you, Mari.
Thanks so much for being here today. We look forward to seeing you again at our next presentation. Um, our presentation, we've got a couple of things that are happening in person next week. And then our last presentation of the month is on Tuesday, February 28th. And it is for Navigating Arizona Long-Term Care, which is all techs and VA aid and attendance. Um, if you're interested in that talk, please give us a call at 520-324-1960. Uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.